Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is part two of my conversation with journalist extraordinaire Errol Lewis. People dying in the streets and the NYPD tapes, better school alternatives and setting kids up to fail, Atlantic Yards, the birth of a nutty nation, tea partiers and American ideals, thinking outside the cell, and Arizona. Joining me to talk about these and more is Errol Lewis, columnist for the Daily News and a member of its editorial board and a CNN contributor. Errol also hosts a morning radio show on WWRL AM 1600 and writes a column, Commerce and Community, for the Our Time Press, published twice a month and based in Bedford-Stuyvesant. His blog, SaveBrooklynNow.blogspot.com, tracks the stunning rise in crime in some neighborhoods throughout the city. We've got lots to talk about yes, and a indeed. little time to do it in. Let's start with what I see as one of your signal contributions to the dialogue, and that is captured in your, the, head, the headline of your June 3rd column, People Are Dying Out in the Streets. Talk about the state of many of the city neighborhoods. Sure. For, for many years during the Bloomberg administration, there's been this kind of um, subterranean conversation going on. Up at the top, getting all the headlines, is all of the happy talk about the crime drop, the historic lows, and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. But um, by the NYPD's own statistics, there have been some neighborhoods for whom that, that has just not been the case, where there have been, you know, comparing today to the day Mike Bloomberg was sworn in, double-digit percentage increases in violent crime, felony assaults, rapes, uh, homicides. You look at Southeast Queens, there's a real problem. Mm -hmm. You look at the neighborhood where I live, which is Crown Heights, you sure. look at the, the Brooklyn North neighborhoods in Brownsville, East New York, Bedford-Stuyvesant, there are some real serious problems. And there are a lot of folk out there who feel like their story is just not even being heard. And it really just literally adds insult to injury that um, uh, people are, are, are terrified with good reason. People see that there's a real problem. And then they can't get anybody in the media to even spare them a little sub-headline about how this is a real serious issue that City Hall and One Police Plaza have not dealt with. You're the only journalist who really has focused on this. Why? Why the lack of media attention? What is it about the story, the people, the journalist? What is it? Well, I, I think that, look, the story does come out once in a while, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, a drop in an ocean of, uh, of the happy talk uh, about uh, how crime is down. There, I think there are a lot of, uh, frankly, there are a lot of folks who were around when things were really bad right. at the height of the crack epidemic sure. in the 1980s. And for them, you just can't get them off this story of, well, look, it's a lot better than it used to be. You know, it's like, it's like trying to write about graffiti on the trains, right? I mean, you, you try and write about it now, the scratch ED or something, and old timers like us will say, look, you, you, you ain't seen nothing. You have to have been here when it was like a psychedelic, you know, kind of a... Uh, yeah, except the old graffiti was more, more artistically interesting than no, the scratch ED. I don't know about I mean, this that. Is, not this the, is, not this the is, inside graffiti. It was, oh, kind of, okay. it was kind of scary. Okay, it looked okay, like the okay, walls okay. were moving and stuff. But, 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 but what, what we've got here with the crime story is... Um, uh, uh, people have got to get together and speak out. And this almost tracks perfectly, in a way, with political voicelessness, political powerlessness. Go. One thing that you find in these neighborhoods is, and I've, I've tried to write pretty consistently about this, is when it's time to uh, put some resources into the neighborhood to try and shore up the situation, to stop the crime from spreading, there aren't enough nonprofits. There aren't enough recreation centers. There aren't enough community leaders who can be, frankly, trusted and have the, both the expertise and the in integrity to sort of take a bunch of money and convert it into useful programs. There's this civic infrastructure that, that has rotted away, and that's where the criminals uh, are going to go. That's where they get to play. Where do you build up, then, the civic infrastructure? Very tough. It's very tough. I mean, there, there needs to be a lot of conversation. You have to sort of stitch people together, help them find each other, um, start to uh, sort of plant some seeds, find some young people, uh, introduce to them the idea that, you know, you can 
go to a foundation and ask them for a bunch of money and they'll actually give it to you and you know you have to not steal that money you have to not misuse that money you have to keep close track of it but you can get the resources that are needed and and there's a whole panoply of programs out there that you could sort of pick from I don't think people realize that that's even a, a profession. We treat it as if it's some, some, some charitable vocation, when in fact it's an almost scientific profession mm -hmm. that in some places you can get a degree in, you know, how to run a nonprofit, how to build it, how to grow it, how to make it um, a, a creative and innovative. And that conversation is, we're, we're so far from having that conversation in some of these neighborhoods that it's almost a cause of despair. It's a cause of great concern. What about the, the relationship between these communities and the police department, between communities and the NYPD? Well, definitely, definitely rocky. Um, probably better than most people think, but, but very rocky in a lot of ways. I mean, there are a number of civic leaders, just talking about my neighborhood in central Brooklyn, there are a number of civic leaders who are on good terms with the, the local command, who um, have, at great risk to themselves, by the way, pointed out and applied pressure, pointed out where the, the drug dens are, where the problems are, who the troublemakers are. Um, and they, they've done that pretty consistently. But this same relatively small group of people are also the people who run the community board and who come to the precinct council and who organize the street fair and who run the local merchants group. And you got uh, uh, too much on the shoulders of just a handful of people. Now, one of the hopes that I have is that with the enormous changes happening, there are a lot of newcomers moving into these neighborhoods, maybe we can sort of broaden out some of the responsibility, bring some new input, um, settle the neighborhood politics, because not everybody's happy about the newcomers, uh, and, and maybe tackle this problem again. Talk about the, the, the frictions between the NYPD and members of these local communities. Well, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, I mean, I, I have a particular view of it because my dad was a... NYPD officer right. for the 30 an years. Inspector. And he retired as an inspector. My sister was a detective. I mean, I, I have a, just a different take on this stuff. Right. But um, my sense is that the stop and frisk has generated a lot of animosity. A lot of people feel still that the cops are both too aggressive and too passive when they need them to step forward. Mm -hmm. So we've got this uh, sort of worst of both worlds where the wrong people are being stopped and 90 plus percent of them, nine plus uh, out of 10, uh, have nothing, no mm -hmm. warrants, no, I mean, just nothing, no weapons, no drugs, no reason to stop them at all. And those people are, become very cynical and skeptical and they start to dislike the police. And on the other hand, you get this other scandal of people going to the station house with a proven crime and it, it gets misclassified or they won't take the report. Okay, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's go to the <laughs> stories. Uh, Three major stories in the Village Voice by Graham Raymond on the NYPD tapes that talks about this this dumbing down or this this dumbing down of of crime statistics. I yes. guess because of the pressure of CompStat and the drive to make these numbers lower, they're overlooking crime. And one of your colleagues at the Daily News, Rocco Perandascola has written about this in the 81st Precinct yes. in Brooklyn near you. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I had him on my show. He's um, a great reporter. And, um, the, you know, look, you're being polite about it. The, the cooking of the numbers, the, the pushing down of the numbers, and there are audio tapes of it. A whistleblower took a tape recorder I surreptitiously know, it's, it's, to roll calls and meetings. It's unbelievable. It was going on primarily in the run-up to last year's election. Okay, let's call it what it is. They were trying to push the numbers down to make it, uh, to, to sort of clean up the record as the mayor was running for a third term. Um, and that part of the story really needs to be fully fleshed out. Now, what to me is extraordinary is that this story, this set of stories didn't have more impact. And as far as I know, never got a formal response from one police plaza. The you NYPD ignore, never you responded. Ignore, you ignore bad news. Come on. Well, you know, there was a time in this town when you couldn't do that, right? Where every question at every mayoral availability and press conference would be about this big story until an answer w w was forthcoming. And um, the, the vaunted New York press corps, my colleagues and friends, Go ahead. they have given this guy a pass. They've given the mayor a pass. They've given the police commissioner a pass. There, there's something fundamental going on. And I think it may, frankly, I'm thinking it may be a manpower issue where a major story like this comes out and it's like it never happened. The TV reporters don't pick up on right. it. The investigative reporters don't pick up on it. It never gets conveyed to the city hall reporters. 
And it's, it's the story comes and the story goes. What is it about the media environment then that doesn't facilitate this pickup of other story and the buildup of other stories? Is it well, simply because bureaus are declining in size? There is a, the shorthandedness is a much more serious problem than I think most people realize. That um, the, the average news gatherer is handling hundreds and hundreds of emails a day demands from all over the place and is struggling to fulfill his or her work allotment um, in the best and most efficient and way possible. And the internet and the web and the blogs facilitate this it makes problem. It, it makes it harder yeah. to get your work done, frankly, because you're, 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 you're sitting here trying to sort of figure out a big story like what's going on in central Brooklyn, and these headlines are raining down on you, and there's all of this blog talk that can whip up a kind of an artificial uh, excitement in the minds of the editors in the newsroom, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're chasing the same one or two headlines that everybody else is, and the big story just uh, kind of drifts away. I think I think that's what's going on. How do you how do you rectify that? Is it rectifiable? I think it is. I think how? it is. I think it is. Well, I mean, look, you train people a little bit differently. You uh, try and get some kind of a dialogue with the producers and the editors, and and try and convey that one way, one sure way that we'll all go down together, is if we collectively fail to serve the public. And to the extent that we we keep doing what we're doing. Um, we are going to keep losing audience. We're going to keep losing readers. We've got to we've got to do a better job, and it's not going to be fixed with little tricks like getting a couple of neighborhood people to start a blog that you put on your website mm. as a news organization. That's that's not that's not where the, the fix is going to be. Uh, I think the fix is going to be um, more more reflection, more reflectiveness. You know, I think. Are you sanguine about that? I. I I have to believe that if we're going to have a future, and I think the public is going to demand that we have a future. Okay. They, they, they just have to... I we, don't know if I buy your assumption, but go the ahead. Public, no, look, the, the democracy doesn't function. And Look, civilization, you know, before there was even civilization, people were sitting around a fire saying, tell me a story. So human beings have it hardwired into them that they want to hear stories. Okay. Now, we are, we're, we're generating stories a mile a minute. Um, the public is telling us in a lot of different ways, including by their purchase patterns, that we're not telling them the stories that they want or need to hear. Mm -hmm. And so um, somebody's going to get reflective, and the person who thinks about it most quickly and most deeply and most successfully is going to have all of the audience and all of the money. Is that going to be Errol Lewis? Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> Another area that you've done a lot of focus on and stories on is the notion of school choice and how we almost force many of our kids to fail. Talk about the issue of school choice, the issue of charters, etc. Well, I, I held off on school choice for a long time, and I haven't put this in my column, but I will tell you. Um, little story. Go on. Forty years ago, um, living in the public housing in West Harlem, my dad was a police officer, had five kids, one of them a special needs kid. He sent us all to parochial school, Church of the Annunciation, over on Amsterdam Avenue. I was in St. Thomas the Apostle, so go ahead. Okay, there you go. Um, uh, when the public schools were just not an option. He had been through the public schools. He wasn't going to send us there. Mm -hmm. He sent us to parochial school until he can do some wizardry, wizardry financially with his West Indian aunt, and we buy a house in the suburbs and we leave, and that's where I got my education. Forty years later, here I am living in the city with my little boy. Right. I've got exactly the same choices he's got. I've got a public school that is uh, unthinkable. They, got a, they scored an F on, uh, on a recent uh, report card. Uh, I can pay tuition for private school, mm -hmm. or I can move back to the same suburb. And the opponents of charter schools do not realize how infuriating that is to somebody like me. That for me, 40 years after the fact, to have the same rotten choices, and thank God I can exercise those choices, what about the parents who can't? And it's and, and I took my time, and I didn't want to get into this fight because this is almost like a religious war going on. Oh, it is. Charters, it's right? a matter of faith. And I, I really tried to stay out of it, but at this point, I didn't feel like I could continue to avoid it because I'm personally now invested, mm -hmm. and so uh, so I'm in it, and I'm in, I'm in it on the side of charters because. You can give me all of the arguments about why they're bad and they lead to privatization and they're creaming the students and all of this other kind of stuff. All I see is what I saw when I went to Harlem to look at the Harlem Success Academy. Go ahead. I saw kids in a high-performance learning environment. I have been blessed to have been in many high-performance learning environments 
uh, at Harvard and at Yale and at Brooklyn Law School uh, on a good night for me anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and hopefully in some of the classes that I've taught at the university level over right. the last decade. So one thing I do know is about learning. And I know it when I see it. You can smell it from the minute you walk in the door. And it's so important and it's so precious. And I want it to be in Harlem the way it should have been there for me 40 years ago, the way it should be there for me now in central Brooklyn. And it's not, at least not in sufficient quantity. And uh, parents who want it, they're going to have it. They're going to have it. It doesn't matter who gets in their way. They're going to have it. How do you get it? How do you get more of it? Well, well here's one thing that is happening. I think, the t I think, frankly, I think the corner has been tipped, and, and for a couple of different reasons. Um, the parochial schools are closing. Those Catholic yep. schools we went to are yep. closing. You know why? Yep. The parents are going to charter schools now. They've got a free alternative now. They don't have to come up with the tuition. And um, a lot of the religious schools and the Protestant schools, a lot of the Baptist churches sure. that ran these schools yep. for a yep. long yep. time, yep. those are closing too. Yep. Why? They're going to charters. And... Those parents who would have sent their kids to parochial school, would have sent them to private schools, those are not shrinking violence, uh, uh, violence. Those are, those are noisy, uh, demanding parents who have contacts downtown, who know how to organize stuff, who know how to get what they want. Um, they're on the side of charters. And by the way, they have a friend in the White House right now. And because it's Barack Obama, it eliminates the whole racial issue, or at least it, it tempers it. And... Um, I know, you know, I mean, look, one thing you learn in the news business is you know when there's a trend, when there's a social force mm -hmm. and a movement gathering. This movement has gathered a lot of strength, a lot of credibility, friend in the White House, a lot of resources, a lot of parents, a lot of, a lot of, um, a, a lot of pressure. And um, we are watching the renovation and the innovation of American education take place before our eyes. It's a, it's a big story and a very interesting one. Okay. You wrote a column on March 24, 2010, that was titled Thinking Outside of the Cell. And the thesis of the piece is that one of the unanticipated beneficent consequences of the state's fiscal crises are the closing of prisons. And you cite Texas, of all places, yes. as, as, as the illustration. Yes. Talk about yes. that. Yes, yeah, number one. I mean, um, New York has, uh, its prisoner count has dropped, Texas is dropping, a number of states around the nation, and I've been to conferences, this has been brewing for about 10 years now, actually, and it's finally coming to fruition. Uh, I've been down and talked to legislators in Louisiana, there have been conversations with people in Connecticut, uh, this has been going on literally for years, and surprisingly enough, some of the most vocal uh, proponents of shrinking, downsizing, and closing prisons, and finding alternatives to them, are the wardens. They know better than anybody else sure. that they are engaged in an expensive, futile failure, and they don't want that to be their legacy on earth. And on top of it, they're producing perverse consequences in the prison. They know it very well. That, that you, you know, I mean, like, like here's an example. It happens all. It happens every day, and people are finally locked into the wastefulness of it. You got a guy who maybe he's not an angel, but you know, maybe he gets high on the weekend. Not a great guy, but he's got enough of a support system that. They're going to they're gonna keep him. He's going to be fine. He's going to show up at his job for the most part. Uh -huh. He's going to even maybe raise a family. You slam that guy with some of these draconian laws. You send him away to prison. Now he's not fine. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and you're paying $40,000 a year to turn somebody into a complete social failure. And then you're going to export him back to that same community 40, on average 44 months later. This is not a formula for success, financially, culturally, or anything else. And so... Um, I think people are finally recognizing that. If nothing else, the two to four thousand dollars it costs for each round of addiction treatment, because substance mm. abuse is very often at the right. core of this thing, um, is a far superior alternative to paying forty thousand dollars a year to lock somebody up. You lock up somebody for ten years, you know, you've basically given somebody, and it's often a parole officer, somebody who's got no oversight. There's no no visibility to the public, no mm -hmm. accountability to the public. They are imposing millions of dollars of costs on the state on an almost daily basis, mm -hmm. completely outside of any review. And this, this can't go on. The budget people have decided that it can't go on. Uh, the elected officials, once you explain it to them, they say, yeah, this can't go on. And I think the general public, once you explain it to them, of whatever political background, will say, yeah, we can't. We can't do this. We cannot spend a million dollars locking up a handful of people on one city block. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there's almost, you can almost take half that amount, put it in a barrel, and leave it in the middle of the street, right. and it would be a more effective use of the money. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back to a topic we touched on last week, and that is corruption. 
You've done a number of pieces in the last several months, one called Taking Out the Political Trash, and one of my favorites, since I'm a resident of one of the states, New York and New Jersey's Corrupt Cousins. What is it? Is there, is there really have an outbreak of corruption, or has this always been there? It just seems as if both states... There's something out there. They are, the, yeah, the argument for it being an outbreak, I think, um, I'd feel stronger making that argument if I hadn't um, seen it continuously for the last 25 years. Okay. So, so I, I tend to think that this is like organized crime, and I don't say that to be funny, but I say that in a very literal sense sure. that you can lock up a bunch of mobsters, and there's a whole class of people waiting to step in behind them. I mean, and... It doesn't matter if you see a Paul Castellano shot to death on uh, in front of Spark Steakhouse in, right. in Manhattan. Um, there's somebody who probably did it who thinks, I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to get away with it. I'm going to do the John same Gatti, thing. for example. And who died in prison. And right behind him is somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. So my sense of it is that there are people um, who go into politics for all the wrong reasons. And I'll give you two examples. Go Talk ahead. about corrupt cousins. You got Miguel Martinez up in Manhattan. He ends up pleading guilty, and it turns out from pretty much the day he took off, even the day before, he was grabbing with both hands. And right. then you got this kid, uh, uh, what was his name, Camarana, the youngest mayor in the history of uh, of Hoboken, and they they get and him he runs on, tape. on a clean up, clean he's up a reformer. Right, runs he's a reformer. Runs as a reformer, and barely has he been elected. Then he's being recorded by FBI people saying you know, screw the people who weren't with us, and he's taking money in the back of a parking lot and all of this kind of stuff, and these are youngsters. So it's not like they put in a life of public service and they just got frustrated with the low pay right. and no, went No, they bad. went into steel. They went into steel. They were criminals who went into politics, not politicians who became crooks. And okay. that's, I think that's permanent. I think that's permanent. I mean, if, if you are a crook, if you are looking to steal, the openness of our open society provides you with a lot of opportunities. Are there any structural elements that facilitate this corruption? You know, the reformers will tell you that at the, at the bottom of it all is a lack of um, campaign finance, you know. But Miguel Martinez was part of the campaign finance system. And he stole I mean, anyway. Yeah, and he stole anyway. I mean, there are any, there are any number of people who, who that would be true of. So... Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't, I don't know that there's a structural fix. I think that there's probably the best structural fix, self-interested, of course, is a, uh, a thriving, vibrant uh, press that will uh, keep a close eye on them and tell the public when something has gone wrong. Tea parties. Patriots. The, the title of one of the pieces, The Birth of a Nutty Nation. Are we going through some kind of psychic breakdown here? Well, we've seen this movie before. You're we a have? You're a student of history. Yeah. Um, the, every now and then you get a, an outbreak of nativist sentiment where um, uh, folk feel that they've been treated unfairly economically or they feel culturally insecure. Status anxiety. Both in this case. And uh, they lash out. And the enemy of the moment are um, progressives and Muslims. You know, and then you get a... And uh, government. Well, right. As, well, and the head of the government is a progressive who happens to have a Muslim name. So, <laughs> and he's it's black. All wrapped up in one. And um, there's, uh, I think, like most movements, this one will run its course when its aims have been achieved. Now, its aims, contrary to what they say, go ahead, are not to take my country back or anything like that. I've said all all along that I don't think there's anything going on here that can't be cured with a five point drop in the unemployment rate. rate. Yeah. So. You, you can you can partly so you're fix saying it. this is really an economic issue rather than a cultural or a status issue. I mean it all it starts to flow together, but I think most um, cultural status anxiety episodes have at their root an economic instability, and the inc economic instability is undeniable in this case. So um, my guess is that it'll bleed off a lot. You can bleed off a lot of the anxiety if, you, if, if we get jobs back. Okay, political implications for 2010 and beyond for state and national politics mm. here. I don't think they've made as many inroads as they think they've made with independence. And so I think they're going to be very unpleasantly surprised. And frankly, the story hasn't been told well enough. They've been losing election after election in a lot of these primary states. They have been trying to take on Republican establishment candidates and failing over and over again in Virginia. They just had a whole series of losses that barely got reported outside of the Washington Post. 
Um, they lost that race in upstate New York. They have uh, tried to put forward candidates who uh, the general public has not accepted. But then you have somebody like Rand Paul out there talking about doing away with the Civil Rights Act. So well, he, he might succeed, or I should say, he might get elected despite himself. I, I don't know if that's going to be true everywhere. There are some others who are really pretty far gone. And um, when you look at the candidate Engel, I think is her name. Right. She has made some statements about Harry Reid and about politics. I don't think she's going to win in Nevada. And, you know, we'll, obviously we'll see we'll as Election say. Day gets closer, but I, I, don't think, I don't think they cohere as a force. I don't think they find great electoral success. Uh, the few that do, I think, are going to conform pr pretty quick. Once they figure out that being a senator means you have to raise ten or $20,000 every day, Sundays included, mm -hmm. I think they're going to get to work and try and figure out how to preserve themselves. Okay, last question. Arizona. I'm not saying anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a very, very woefully unfortunate situation there. I mean, one thing I learned uh, from years of sitting next to Lou Dobbs on the set and listening to his broadcast is that there really is chaos on the southwest border. Immigration down there is fundamentally different from the way it plays out here in mm -hmm. New York. Um, you know, most of our uh, illegal immigrants here are visa overstays. Mm -hmm. They come on vacation yep. and they never leave. Yep. Down there, it's an entirely different situation with the border crossing, with the drug gangs, with the violence. Uh, with the inability to secure the border. And um, uh, this legislation, which I think is probably illegal, there's some Supreme Court precedent that says you can't, as a state, step in and start doing the business. Because it's a federal responsibility. Yeah, it's a federal responsibility. Um, you know, it was litigated decades ago. And so I, I feel like they're making a statement, and it's a statement, frankly, that needs to be made, which is that the federal government still has not arrived at any kind of a plausible, credible solution to border security and the larger question of immigration reform. It's, it's just got to get done. The H-1B visa program is a scandal, the legal visas that right, you get. Right. The, uh, the border enforcement is a scandal. The uh, lack of conversation about it, frankly. <laughs> the fact right, that you exactly. can't get any legislation uh, uh, even started is also a scandal. So we've got uh, a lose-lose that the president says he's going to fix. I'm not sure why he felt he had to say it. Rahm Emanuel, his chief of staff, said it would be a great priority for their second term. Right. And uh, he, right. he got publicly overruled by the president. So we'll, 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 we'll see what say. it comes up with. We'll see. Yeah. My thanks to Errol Lewis, journalist extraordinaire, for being my guest these last two weeks. See you next week when we will talk with. What does CUNY P mean? Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.